Hello there. She took most of my lines, but that's fine. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, two billion um, fears and um, about 100,000 uh, dreams. But first of all, um, I let a couple of other people talk about what the real issue is with uh, meat production, um, because they can do it much better than, uh, the story than I can. Of human evolution is one that is intimately tied to meat. Once we started cooking meat, then we could get lots of energy, and that energy enabled us to have big brains and become physically, anatomically human. Hunters and gatherers all over the world are very sad if, for a few days at a time, the hunters come back empty-handed. The camp becomes quiet, the dancing stops, and then somebody catches some meat, they bring the prey into the camp, or nowadays into somebody's back garden with a barbecue, everybody gets excited to come and share the meat. It is ritually cut and passed out to people. We are a species designed to love meat. Feeding the world is a complex problem. I think people don't yet realize what an impact meat consumption has on the planet. 18% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from meat production. We're also using something like 1,500 gallons of water to produce just one pound of meat. Meat takes up about 70% of our arable lands. There's no question that if we were able to shift more of our land into intensive fruit and vegetable production, we'd be able to feed a lot more people a lot healthier diet. With the global population growing from 7 billion to 9 billion people, by 2050, the demand for meat will double. We can't just continue doing what we've been doing. Unless we make some changes in how we produce meat on this planet, we're in for a terrible reckoning. Meat consumption was part of the human species. It's been fantastically beneficial for us. And now, by some horrendous irony, it's become part of a system that threatens our species. We have to do something about it. Okay, so I hope they have convinced you that, there, that we have an issue, that we have a real problem. And there are several ways of dealing with it. Uh, we have several solutions, of course. We can all become vegetarian. Now, how many vegetarians can, can everybody who is very vegetarian raise their hands? So it's about roughly uh, an average of a um, industrialized society, three to five percent. That number hasn't grown in the last 35 years. Um, and it's not only that, we can, um, a lot of people argue that we are eating less and less meat. And actually in our parts of the world, that's true. But if we want to convert meat eaters to vegetarianism, um, we are not the population to address. We have to address the population in um, the emerging economies, like in China and um, uh, India and Russia. And of course, um, you know, I don't need to tell you that um, we all eat too much, and um, that also uh, converting, for instance, to vegetarianism is, you know, 20% of the population worldwide is vegetarian, so uh, they live, um, and it's not necessarily for, for your health uh, eating meat, but it is something that we, in the words of David Rangham, are designed to do. So, um, in order to avert that um, trend in eating, um, we would have to address these guys, the, the growing middle class in China, in um, India, and in uh, Russia. Um, and for some reason, um, well, this is the, uh, the, the middle class production, share, or, uh, consumption, shares of uh, middle class uh, consumption. And you see on your uh, uh, left hand, in purple and, and uh, light purple, that it's currently Europe and the US, no surprise, but that in the coming uh, decades that will change dramatically and middle class consumption is going to be primarily located in Asia, um, uh, India and, uh, and Russia. And for some reason uh, South America is sort of um, uh, trailing behind. Uh, we don't know but it's an interesting uh, case uh, because we would think that also their middle class would grow but we already have seen the Gini um, equation um, or ratio for uh, the uh, for uh, South America, uh, it's, it's, increasingly rap it's increasing rapidly, so somewhere that middle class is sort of skipped in, that, in those countries. But anyway, 
So we can all become vegetarians, which is very unlikely to happen, and especially in the um, emerging economies. Um, and there is another solution. And Churchill already in 1932 said in his book, um, Thoughts and Adventures, that um, someday we would be able to just grow um, a breast or a leg of a chicken without growing the whole bird. Um, because it's not a very efficient way of producing food. He was befriended to Alexis Carell, the famous Nobel Prize winner physiologist, who at that point could, for the first time in uh, history, keep organs alive outside of the, uh, the body. But they didn't have the technology to grow tissues yet. And currently we do. From the medical technology, um, uh, some uh, procedures have, uh, have come up that enable us to basically grow pretty much every tissue of the human body or of animal bodies. And so we can also use that to grow meat. And the procedure is very simple. You take a biopsy from a cow um, that has a little piece of muscle, and in that muscle we have so-called stem cells, but these are designated skeletal muscle stem cells. They can only become stem cells. And they are sitting there waiting to repair the tissue in case of injury. And the nice thing about them is that they, of course there's also fat tissue, um, and the nice thing about them is that they divide. They can multiply. And from one cell, theoretically, we can make 100 trillion cells, which doesn't tell you a lot, but it's about 10,000 kilos of meat from one single cell. So from that little biopsy where we easily have a couple of hundred cells, we can grow a tremendous amount of uh, meat if we just change the technology and let not do the cow its work. These cells are uh, pretty smart. We don't have to do too much. We have to feed them, of course. I will come back to that later. Um, but then they merge because a, a skeletal muscle cell, is basic, which is the basis of meat, basically a very large cell, merged cells of um, a large number of cells. And they do that more or less by themselves, uh, produce these uh, what we call myotubes. It's actually a very primitive uh, muscle fiber. And then the other trick that we need to pull is that we need to somehow let them grow in a situation where they can develop tension, because that's what our muscles do. They develop tension and they contract. And by doing that, they produce more protein. And that's, of course, the objective in um, growing tissue for meat um, or for food. So what we do now is we, uh, we trick them. We actually um, uh, uh, lay them around a central hub of gel. It's that gray thing here in the picture. And then they grab each other and they form a sort of ring, so like a uh, Ouroboros uh, type of system. They bite each other in the tail. Um, and then they uh, start contracting and they start bulking up and making proteins. So it's, they do that pretty much by themselves, which is fortunate for us. And then they bulk up and they form a typical skeletal muscle fiber. Um, you can harvest them, cut them open, and you have a strand again. And if you have 10,000 or 20,000 of these, you assemble them. Um, you can do the same with uh, fat tissue, and then you basically have a hamburger. <coughs> it sounds like a very complex way of doing things, um, and, uh, but it's, it's actually fairly uh, easy. Um, of course, uh, people who have read the newspapers lately know that this uh, burger right now uh, has costed about 250,000 euro, um, which is kind of expensive. Um, uh, but um, uh, to me, that's sort of a nice number because it tells you it's not a real product yet, uh, but we are uh, getting there. And we, at some point, decided, well, we're going to present this to the public um, in a sort of hybrid... Um, I cut out the... Uh, the, the sound in a sort of hybrid between a cooking show and a press conference, and um, presented this. And of course, uh, for the last two years, um, I had reporters asking me over and over, you know, have you tasted it and, and how does it taste? So we couldn't get around to tasting, so we had two courageous uh, volunteers. Uh, this is Hanni Rutzler from Austria, and she um, uh, tasted this and um, made all sorts of remarks about the taste, um, basically confirming what we already knew, uh, because of course we had tasted it many times, that it's, it's pretty close to meat, but it's not quite there yet, which is another way of saying, you know, we are not, this is a concept. And what we have shown is that it can be done. That's the major um, message. Of course, a technology like this, if it were to replace livestock meat production, 
it needs to be both efficient, more efficient than a cow, and unfortunately, a cow is very, very inefficient for every 15 grams of meat. You have to feed it 100 grams of vegetable proteins. Um, but we still have to show that we can do that more efficiently. And second, it has to be meat, nothing else. It has to completely mimic the taste and feel and, and uh, smell and um, uh, uh, nutritional value of uh, meat. Because there are meat substitutes galore um, from vegetable origin, they're just not exactly the same, and we want to make exactly the same. So, when we... Um, for the last two years, when we thought about this, um, there were actually uh, also the Dutch government actually funded even a program on is this going to be accepted by the public? And so we had some worries there. Um, are people going to eat this? Um, uh, the, which is sort of the so called yuck factor. You know, I don't want really a hamburger out of a laboratory um, or out of a factory for that matter. And um, this is what in my mind is sort of fear for the unknown, fear for a new product that is now industrialized, people can mess with it, large companies can mess with it, and um, you know, we, we, something w which we sort of look at is as if it's natural, growing in a cow, nice animal, nobody can, well, we can give it antibiotics and we can give it steroids, which we do, but f for the rest we cannot mess with it too much. And now, um, uh, doing this in the laboratory, we can basically mess with everything, if you like. So, my um, uh, thought has always been that this yuck thing came from the fear, hence the headlines in newspapers, Frankenfood and Lab Chops and uh, whatever, all these ugly uh, names. And one of the great, probably the best outcome of this uh, presentation was that um, The Guardian did a poll um, among their readers, now granted this might be a selected uh, readership, um, saying that 68% of the British people were willing to try this and uh, uh, would want to eat this, which is very, very encouraging. So that's why I still talk about the two billion fears, because those are basically the people out there um, who are eating meat and who want to eat meat but are not yet willing to try an alternative. And the interesting thing, during the product, uh, project, a 16-year-old um, high school girl from this neighborhood um, came to me and said, I want to do my, my final year pro uh, project on this. And she um, designed sort of a uh, survey, a sort of poll, um, asking basically her friends and family, you know, what would you, would you want to eat this? Would you? So I said, well, you know, I, I will help you. And I, I helped a little bit with the questioning. And then she pulled it off to get a professional survey um, agency uh, bureau in the Netherlands flycatcher to do a, that survey under 15,000 people here in the Netherlands, a cross-section of the population, Not, no selection whatsoever. And um, of those people, 63% also was expressing the willingness to try this and eat this. So, my, um, I'm getting a little bit bolder now, you see, because um, I, I used to be very careful and how are you going to approach uh, the public because there might be all these fears and it appears that it actually is not too much of a problem. So, uh, but one way of addressing those other two billion fears is to dissociate the product from, or the idea, the technology, from the implementation of that technology. Um, being in a factory or in a laboratory. a laboratory. So we thought of the idea of, could you do this at home, right? Small scale, um, you do this at home, in between your vegetable garden, which if you live in a city is basically your kitchen, uh, like this uh, kitchen here, futuristic uh, kitchen, um, and your bread maker that your father got for Father's Day, um, and that is now probably collecting dust on the attic, but anyway, if you still are using it, you, in between that you can have an incubator where you um, grow your own meat. Not very practical, but it's the mindset. It's getting to seeing the difference between the technology and the implementation of it, which might be fearful. Um, and why is it not practical? Uh, these cells need about a day to divide. So if you do the math, uh, you have to know eight, nine weeks in advance what you are going to eat, which I personally don't. Okay, but it's uh, again uh, uh, playing with the uh, mindset. 
And becoming sort of a little bit more uh, imaginative, um, you could think of all sorts of things that you could do once you have accepted the idea of producing meat this way. We can make combinations of meat. Like there is this dish in the United States where you eat a lobster and a steak, which is kind of cumbersome. You have to cook them separately, and you can make one tissue out of it, um, a, a lobster steak, and then uh, cook it in one piece. Uh, but how about a uh, woolen, um, a woolen rabbit um, uh, chop, or a uh, flaming giraffe um, steak, or a um, mythological burger from a minotaur? So you can think of all sorts of creative ways of producing new uh, products. Also, because we have all those variables under control, you can make the product more healthy. Uh, we know that these cells and also the fat cells can actually produce omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. In a cow, they can do that. Uh, but they typically don't do that because of the feed. Um, but we can coerce these cells in the laboratory to uh, make these omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids so that you can make a more healthy piece of uh, meat. So we have these, uh, these opportunities. And uh, now we come to the, uh, to the dreams. Um, and not only our dreams, but also the dreams of cows, because of course their role in society will change after this. This might be a concern. Um, but um, I think from the cow's perspective, it's probably a good concern to have. So now suddenly from uh, being just food, it can uh, imagine of being, a, be, being proud of being a donor of stem cells for our food production, but still stay alive being even more proud, being a donor for medical tissues, which already is being done, um, and at the same time dreaming about getting old, um, spending older days in, uh, in the pastures, um, hopefully without too many uh, uh, degenerative diseases, such as people have, um, or they can uh, switch careers and go into a, a, a children's farm where they get the continuous attention of these uh, loving child. So, um, I'm, I was trying to tell you that um, the fears associated with this come with, uh, um, come with solutions, with, uh, and we have to sort of analyze where those fears are coming from, and then you can pretty easily, I think, find solutions, and on the whole, it tends to be um, less worse than we originally thought. Um, you guys, and me too, are generally more advent um, um, adventurous in our food intake. I guess I saw a lot of people eat the bugs um, uh, or the, the, the chicken nuggets, so that's also a um, uh, point in case that we are generally much more adventurous uh, here. And um, that we can, once we get over that fear, we can start imagining and dreaming about novel sort of products and novel uh, uh, futures for our whole uh, food chain. And then also we can um, allow the um, cows to have their dreams. So um, I think this is going to be the future. Um, and I think uh, you are ready for it. <laughs>